That's a good looking man right there. You don't have to know what that is by a hat. You didn't want to mess up the hair. No, we're really out here to do the annual Thursday morning roll call to make sure that those that stayed out too late last night are actually here. I'll start with the legacy list. Dean Conwell, are you out there? Oh, hey, it's okay. Really, I'm just here to make sure my staff's here. Uh, no, I'm here to introduce our keynote speaker this morning, uh, this morning Dr. Eli Jones. Uh, he's very influential here on Texas A&M's campus, uh, but more importantly, I also want to recognize his wife, Fern Jones, one of my inaugural board members. We would not be Destination Bride today if it were not for Fern, so thank you. Yeah. So with that, I'll, I'll get into uh, Dr. Jones a little bit. So. He's a highly accomplished professor of marketing here at Texas A&M, author, speaker, and current Lowry and Peggy Mays eminent scholar. Dr. Jones has made significant contributions to the academic community, publishing over 50 peer-reviewed research articles in top academic journals, and co-authoring several professional books on sales and sales leadership. His latest book, Making Differences Work, features a new values-based, people-centric approach to achieving the goals of the diversity, equity, inclusion, and business performance. Dr. Jones, we are very excited to have you here today. Everyone, please help me in welcoming Dr. Eli Jones. to come and address you this morning. And I can already tell this is a fun crowd. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. I, I'm excited to introduce something to you today. And it's all about community. So it fits right within your wheelhouse, building communities. Uh, as John said, my wife, Fern, got very involved in the board, the inaugural board, and uh, Destination Bright. How many of you had a chance to visit Brighton? Let me see a show of hands. All right, good, good. Welcome to Aggie Land. That's what we say. Welcome to Aggie Land. I'll do just a little bit more of an introduction because there is something special about this place. There really is. Lexi will find out. She will find out. So, one, I had the privilege of graduating from this university three times. Wow. Three times. I carry the ring. What you need to do is go see the big ring at the former students association of former students office. Have you had a chance to see that? Oh, it's special. Take some pictures while you're there. It's a gigantic ring. We make a big deal out of the ring. The ring is recognized around the world. I've had the privilege of teaching around the world while I'm on an airplane many times. Someone will look at the ring and say, oh, you graduated from the It is a community, the Aggie community, very, very strong. So I want to talk a little bit about building a community. I'm going to base some of this on Peter Block's book. Have you read that one? No. Oh, I highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. How many of you have heard of Sense of Belonging? Mm -hmm. Sense of Belonging. Okay. He's one of the first people to introduce Sense of Belonging, what that means. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to focus on that, the community, and how do you build a sense of belonging. And what I want to share with you is, yes, people have talked about the reasons why we should have a sense of belonging in our communities and in our businesses. So I served as a business dean here, Mays Business School. I served here from 2015 to 2021. So I'm a business professor. I'm a business guy. And many times when we talk about the work that you're doing, we're talking about economic development, right? Mm -hmm. Am I in the right room? Yeah. <laughs> you know, okay, good. Economic development. I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Why would we want to focus on a sense of belonging? And I'm going to build a business case for a sense of belonging. I mentioned I was the dean here. Let me give you a little bit more information on that because it's relevant. So look, I'm a graduate of Mays Business School. It wasn't Mays when I was a graduate. All right, Mays Business School. And what's special about that is, get this, get this. The folks who taught me, my professors, invited me back 
to leaders. Whoa. Whoa. Which means as the dean, I was their boss's boss's boss. The folks who thought that's special. And right about this time, I always tell my faculty, be careful how you treat your students. <laughs> <laughs> we can become your boss. <laughs> we can become your boss. All right, so it is a special time. Let's talk about this idea of community and sense of belonging. Now, how many of you love statistics? Let me see a show of hands. Oh, that is, oh, look at that. Wow. I've never been in a room with so many people who love statistics. <laughs> Jay, my story is I was in corporate. I worked for Quaker Oats, Nabisco, and Trino Lake, and we <clears throat> gave up that full-time job. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> gave up that paycheck. Yeah. Gave up the company car. And I looked at my wife and I said, I think I want to go back to school. She went, what? <laughs> we made it. Four children going through the PhD program for another four years. Wow. We made it. It was tough. But we're here today to really talk about some of the benefits of going through that. One of the surprises, though, was right after I quit my job, I joined here to the PhD program. And my major professor said, oh, by the way, you're going to have to minor in statistics. I went, God, bless, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> oh, if right in the middle of the program, I uh, took a copy of a book that I was reading. And this is the name of the book. I can't make this up. Structural Equations Modeling with Latent Variables. <laughs> Sounds like fun, huh? <laughs> Can I go read? I took the book to my mom, who was alive at the time, and I said, Mom, I just want to show you what they're teaching me. And she looked at the book, all these formulas, and she went, oh, bless your heart. <laughs> <laughs> what are they doing to you, son? <laughs> well, I went on to go through the process, and I started working with organizations. So one of the, one of the benefits of that is, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about it, John mentioned it. We have a brand new book that's coming out, and it's going to be available on November 1st. And the name of the book is Making Differences Work. Now, what's special about it is I co-authored this book with the CEO of Insperity. Have you ever heard of Insperity? You have? All right, it's an HR outsourcing company. And so we work with, I'm on their board, we work with small and medium-sized business owners those who want to outsource their HR function. And so we do the payroll, workers' compensation, all those things that business owners really don't want to fool around with. We always say, look, you, we'll take care of the HR so you can focus on your business. And that's the central value proposition of Inspirity. And what's interesting about it is Paul Cervati, the founder, co-founder, and CEO of Inspirity, reached out to me and said, hey, I really want to understand what's going on in our country right now, all right? We're divided. We're divided. You know that. Yeah. I'm hoping we can find a solution. And I'm hoping that this book, pardon the pun, will make a difference. Because what we're going to show you is what's the power of really coming together, which is exactly what you guys are doing. Right? You're right. building these communities, you're attracting visitors to come and be exposed to your community. You want them to have a sense of belonging. And while they're there, you want them to go out and have dinner and enjoy, right? That affects economic development. All right? So I'm going to get into that just a tad. All right? So let me get into it now. Again, it's making differences work. I'm going to walk through, and it's going to involve some stats. Oh, man, that's like starting your day with statistics, right? <laughs> ah. All right, we're going to get into that. So I want to tell you about this particular study that we did. And the purpose, again, was to find out how we can really build on commonalities, not differences. Right? Commonalities. Now, I want you to look at your neighbor. I'm going to give you just a minute or two. Look at take your neighbor, left or right, doesn't matter to me. All right. And I want you to say, you know what? I don't care. I don't care how you look. 
I want you to look at your neighbor and say, we have something in common. We have <laughs> many things in common. <laughs> That's easy. Yes. 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 <laughs> we have a lot in common. <laughs> Trouble. Yeah. Trouble. Yeah. Yeah. You two over a glass of bourbon would be scary. Yeah. <laughs> so, so Paul and I got into this discussion. We actually have more things in common than we have that's different. So why don't we talk about what's in common? Not so much what's different. You see? Now, we have it in the book. We have a whole list of things you ought to consider when we talk about commonality. I, uh, how many of you started using chat GPT? Let me see a show of hands. Artificial intelligence. Perfect. Do you don't like this one? <laughs> I just went to chat GPT. <laughs> And I said, look, and you do the same thing. I said, give me some examples of commonality, right? And you do the same thing. First of all, shared hobbies and interests, right? Cultural traditions, personal experiences. Sharing personal experiences, challenges, and achievements can help break down barriers. Everyday struggles, everyday struggles. How many of you right now have a loved one who's ill? Let me see a show of hands. Mm -hmm. We do too. My wife and I do too. All right? We have that in common. How many of you know someone in your family who's had cancer? Look around. Right. How many of you like the trap? Let me see a show of hands. Every, everyone's <laughs> two hands. You better be up. Two hands. <laughs> two hands. I like that. All right? The list goes on. Why don't we talk about those things? Why don't we talk about those things? We live in the greatest country that's there. We live in the best country. Why don't we celebrate that and come together? And that is the focus of making differences work. That's what we're going to talk about. Now, if you don't believe me, I'm going to introduce you to the science of it. Right? We, Paul and I, got together. We started thinking about people. Hey, we actually have more in common. Let's think about that. And so we started discussing a couple of new concepts, commonality and cohesion. Right? And we want to focus on that. And what we're going to show you, though, using the science, is a sense of belonging can drive economic development. That's the central thing. I hope you get that out of this. And I hope you're inspired to talk more about what we have in common than what we have that's different, right? And so as we got into this conversation about this, Paul and I discussed it. I said, Paul, first of all, I am a social scientist. I'm a researcher. That's what I do for that. Most people would say professor and say you're teaching. This is teaching. But I'm going to show you what we do to actually have the material to teach. We have to do research in order to teach. So 60% of my time is doing studies. And I collect data from all kinds of organizations. In this case, Paul allowed me to go in and survey his 4,000 people in his company. And we use this as a case study. And the book that's coming out November 1, I hope you get it, Making Differences Work, you'll see for yourself the power of commonalities. And that's what we're going to show you. All right? So we went through a very extensive study. Look, you're on a university campus. So hold on to your seats. Mm -hmm. You came here to learn. You came here to explore. And you're right here in my hometown, right here at my university. And I hope you get something out of this. So I want to walk through this study. Right? And I'm glad you got your coffee, because some people fall asleep when I start talking about statistics. <laughs> I'm not your average statistician. I don't even look like your average statistician. All right, so I'm not going to go deep into the stats. I'm going to give you some punchlines as we go through this. All right, I will show you stats, but I'm going to give you some talking points along the way. Got it? All right. So the first thing we do as social scientists is we start thinking about the methodology. That's very important. So we didn't want to guess at this. We actually wanted to use the science to show it. We could have stated our opinions in this book, and we probably would have done just okay with stating our opinions. 
But the first thing I mentioned to Paul was, look, we've got to study this. <laughs> we don't want to branch out on our own with these ideas in an area that people are still challenged. We want to use the science here. And that's what we're going to do. I laid out the methodology for this. Now, listen to this. The first thing was we put together some focus groups. That would be the qualitative work. We put together focus groups. I went out and I talked to folks who were involved in our executive MBA program, and folks in our professional MBA program, and folks in our Masters of Science in Business. Right? We formed teams of five. I had a doctoral student working with me, and he and I would have these conversations with these folks in the focus group sessions. Right? Average of five. We did multiple sessions. And the focus group is I ask open-ended questions, all right? And it's a free flowing of ideas and the conversation. That's what that's about, right? Now, why did I choose this audience? I, cho I chose this audience because these are working professionals. They are in business. We have presidents of companies in our executive MBA program, it makes. Presidents of companies. And so I was interested in really asking them about their company's DEI efforts. Right, so we just started out. And I would ask, tell us about your company's DEI efforts. And we'd talk about that. And then here's the key point. I asked, how effective is your company in this area? Most people looked at me and asked, effective? What do you mean? What do you mean? You see, most people measure this based on percentage of, just hang with me here, I'm gonna to get to a point, the percentage of fill in the blank demographic group at different levels in an organization, right? That's the standard measure. We want it to go far beyond that. We want it to introduce a new way of looking at effectiveness. And we want it to introduce these, and this is important, unifying concepts along the way. Now, what was very interesting is I continued to ask these questions in the focus group setting. We got to the point where I asked them, I said, well, how is your company measuring their DEI efforts? And most of the time, it was just what they said. They said, look, we have a program, all right, but then, and our company requires us to go through this program. Unconscious biases, that's one, you have heard of it, right? That's one way, all right? I said, now, let me ask you this, on a scale of one, to 10, 10 being your company is doing an effective job in this area. And the programs are effective on a scale of one to 10. 10 being yes, very effective. One being not effective at all. Here's what we found. Guess the average on a scale of one to 10. 10 being very effective, one being not effective at all. Someone said, what's your name, ma'am? Four. Four. Three. Let me see. Three. 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 Wow, you must have been in the room. <laughs> <laughs> Average was a three. We had one outlier. One person said it's a seven at our company. And that's an outlier. As a statistician, we take that into account, but we also have outliers, right? The average was three. Why? Why? Most of them said we go through these programs, and guess what? After we finish, we check the box that we went through a program. We check the box. I see people nodding, all right? Checking the box. We wanted to go beyond that, not just checking the box. You see? So the focus group, having the conversations with these people, actually informed what we did next. And so based on those conversations, what we then did is we created a survey and we went out to Paul's employees at Insperity. All right, we got a 50% response rate, which is high in our world. Mm -hmm. It's high, all right, 50% response rate. We had close to 2,000 people participate in the study. And we wanted to find out how they perceive this particular area, all right? Now, I want to share with you. I want you to, maybe, I wish you could see what I see from here. I wish you could see it. I wish you could look at yourselves right, right now. 
I tell you what I see. I see a lot of diversity in this world. I do. All right. I also, and this is the main point, when I was in business, we used to talk about diversity of thought. Diversity of thought. Now, if you don't believe me, look at the science. Diversity is linked to innovation. Look at the science. It's the diversity of thought. When I was in business, even as a dean, I always like to have people with different perspectives in the room as we're solving a problem, right? Because you hear these different ideas, and usually when you combine those ideas, you have the best idea. So I don't want you to lock in on diversity in a certain way. I want you to open your minds. You're at a university campus. That's what we do with students. Like open your minds. Suspend your beliefs. And let's let the science inform what we're doing here. Diversity of thought is an important, important concept. Right? I bet you all, as you've been here at this conference, hopefully many of you have mixed and mingled and you've had some ideas. I bet you have a better idea going home than when you came. But yes, you had a chance to mix with people who have things in common, common interests, right? Perhaps you share with others. Look, in my, in my part of the world, we're wanting to drive more economic development. We're trying to bring people to our community. It's good, we want to drive exposure to what we have that's special here. Am I in the right room still? Yes. Okay, so that's that. And that's why Kathleen and I talked about it. And I said, this, when I was invited, I said, this is what I'm going to share, the most recent study. So this is state of the art. Got it? All right. Equity. Equity. Equity is based on organizational justice theories. Look it up. Which is about fairness. Who doesn't want fairness? Let me see a show. Anyone in the room who doesn't want fairness? That's what equity, equity is. Look at organizational justice. Inclusion, are you kidding me? Who doesn't believe in inclusion in the room? There's even a leadership style that's called inclusive leadership. Look it up. It's one of the most powerful leadership theories out there. People want to be included in the decision. Does that make sense? They want to be included in the decision. You don't want to be the leader with all, always having the best ideas. You want other people to be involved in it. And especially when you look at the people we're graduating and they're joining your organizations, especially this generation. Trust me on that one, right? They expect to be included in decisions, right? They expect that. Mm -hmm. I would love to talk to you about the next generation that's coming. <laughs> All right, so we decided, okay, we're going to do this survey. We're going to get their perceptions of this, and we're going to introduce those more unifying concepts. All right, so let me back up. After that, here we go. After we designed the survey, then we did some statistical analyses, which I'll show you. All right, I'll show you. I'll keep it light. All right. And we also did a peer review. So in our business, which is publishing, we always have peers. All right, who are also in the same area, and they review our work. Most of the stuff we publish is peer review. Right? So it's not just my thoughts. I go out to experts who are in that area and say, hey, what do you think? Am I on the right track? So it was also peer review. Got it? Still with me? Need some more coffee? <laughs> All right, let's get into it. Now, I'm going to go into some stats just to show you the science. And I'm going to share with you, as I've shared with other audiences, kind of the key points, right? What are the statistical analyses that we're looking for to help us understand these phenomena? That's what we're doing, right? And for those of you who, have, who like stats, you ought to, first of all, see the p-values. That's important, all right? So let me explain what that means, all right? A p-value, this is a probability. Statistics is really about probabilities, right? If I gather enough, I can infer from the stats, from the sample, that this is the way it is. That's why having a large sample size is very important. And so if you see a one asterisk on anything that I show you, just one asterisk, all right, that's a p-value of 0.10, which means we're 90% sure 
that these relationships between these concepts exist. Right? If you see two asterisks, right, it suggests that we're 95% sure that these relationships exist. If you see three asterisks, we're 99% sure that these relationships exist. Got it? All right. The other thing that we're going to look at is we're going to look at some coefficients. Those are things on these paths that I will show you. All right. You're going to see some numbers on those paths. You're going to see one, two, or three stars. That will be the p-values. You're also going to see these coefficients, these numbers on each one. What that means is that's how strong the relationships are. One, is it statistically sufficient? Yes. And this is how strong. So we'll get to that in just a bit. Then we look at these different models, all right? So we put together, it's called the nomological network, sorry. But we put together these <laughs> concepts and we look at what's related to what, kind of correlations, if you will, all right? And then we look at overall, each model, we look at their fit statistics. How strong are these models? Got it? All that is baked into what I'm gonna show you. All right, so I'm gonna take my time and I want you to stop me at any point if you have any questions, all right? I didn't send any questions in advance. I would rather hear from you directly. What are some of your questions? We can stop at any time, trust me, all right? Okay, let me, so, let me show you this. So this idea of sense of belonging, hang tight. Sense of belonging is a key construct. Sense of belonging drives, look at this, sense of belonging drives economic development. That's the way I want you to look at it. Now, if I'm talking to a business audience, I'm gonna say sense of belonging will drive market share, profits, it'll drive a lot of these business outcomes. For you, I'm gonna show you, uh, building a sense of belonging can drive economic development. Let me show you how. Let me show you how. On the far right, I want you to look at something that no one else has looked at in the research. Usually, as I said, effectiveness is measured by the percentage of fill in the blank plate of any demographic group, all right, at different levels of the organization. We are saying, hold up a minute. Is there a business case for this? Is there a business case? Look at the far right, and I want you to challenge me. If you don't agree with me, it's okay. You can, you can shake your head, you can beat on the table, doesn't matter to me, right? But let me ask you one question. Who doesn't want a collaborative culture? Where people get together and they collaborate, they work together, it's a collaborative culture. Notice, we're talking about a culture, not a program. It's baked into your culture. Who doesn't want a collaborative culture? Who say your short hands? Okay, good, I am in the right room. <laughs> That's good. Uh, this idea of organizational identification, what that means is alignment of values is what that means. An alignment of values. That means you're in an organization and your values, your personal values align with the organizational values. Does that make sense? All right, I'll give you just a taste. All right, your Lexi is gonna love this part. You're in Aggie land, so I get to say this. We in Aggie land, we have six core values, six. And I tell you what, when Lexi comes, she, we're gonna just brainwash her. <laughs> so when we bring in new students, we have this thing called fish camps, right? And so they go to fish camp, and boy, they're learning how to work together, they're learning about Aggie land and this, and we are really reinforcing our six Aggie core values, and I can tell you, did you have a chance to see the Relis campus, by chance? Anyone, while you're here? Relis, all right? Relis is really a way of capturing our six Aggie core values. The R in Relis is respect, all right? And it's mutual respect, by the way. Respect, that's a core value for us. All right, we, got, we have outliers too. 
but respect. <laughs> Sometimes we have to remind our students we're talking about respect, right? Okay, mutual respect. All right, the E in relics is excellence. Excellence. We really talk to our students about its excellence in all you do. Guess what? Our brand that's known around the world, the whole Aggie part in the ring, mm -hmm. everywhere we go, people should understand what the Aggie core values are. Respect, excellence, leadership. If you go right over to our MSC, the Memorial Student Center, you're gonna see integrity on the building. You see that one? <laughs> leadership on the building. That's part of our Aggie core values. Right? The other one is loyalty. Loyalty is very important to us. I, I tell you, as a dean, I raise a lot of money. I would call on former students, we don't say alumni here, we say former students, right? And going out and raising money to build a world-class business school, I was right there. Half my time, my wife can tell you, half my time was on the road calling on former students and building the case for why they needed to invest in what we're building in this business school. In fact, if you go over to Mays Business School, you're gonna see a brand new building that's going up. I hope you have a chance to pass by. That brand new building, I'm not kidding you, came from my head talking to a group of board members and saying, for us to move up in the rankings, for us to really drive faculty recruitment, for us to have faculty retention, for us to bring in the best students in the country, for us to do those things, we have to have a cutting edge facility. A lot of high tech to that. And I remember talking to the board, I said, look, you know what? Learning has changed. It has. The old days of a professor just standing there and the students in the audience, those days are gone. Students want to work on projects. They want to collaborate. And we're going to work on real world problems. We need spaces, not just classrooms. We need collaboration spaces for these students. And $84 million later, we've got that building that's going up right there at Mays Business School. That's true, right? Why do the... But it's all about these former students. They are really loyal to this organization. Loyalty is one of our Aggie core values, all right? Respect, excellence, leadership, loyalty, integrity is very important to us. Hopefully you'll hire some Aggies. Ask them. Integrity is very important to us. And the last one is selfless service. We serve. In fact, the biggest event we have is called Big Event. <laughs> Here, you should see it. We have thousands of students who will come together and they go out and they work with Habitat for Humanity. They're going out building homes for people. They're going to people's homes and you know helping them clean out the garages and self this service is part of that, right? And so when we recruit faculty members to our organization, we go through the six Aggie core values, respect, excellence, leadership, loyalty, integrity, and self service. That's what we believe in. Now, if you believe in this, you belong here. Those core values. Organizational identification is just that. Whatever organization you join, if your values align with the values of that organization, that's going to drive positive results. Got it? All of this on the right is based on employee engagement. That's what that's based on. All right, look at this other. Who doesn't want discretionary effort? So let's say you have a group of volunteers, right? And you're meeting with your volunteers, which is, boy, that's a true test of leadership, isn't it? <laughs> Leading volunteers, that is a true test. You're not, you're not paying them. <laughs> they can walk. <laughs> you got you to inspire them to do some things. I had a Dean's Advisory Board. That's exactly what that was. Not only were we not paying them, they were paying us to go along. Isn't that amazing? All right? And so this idea of discretionary effort means over and above what's expected. Who doesn't want a group of people, right, who will go over and above what you expect? Anyone? Mm-hmm. 
You can stop at any time and challenge me on any of this. This last one is about innovation, team creativity, new ideas, new ways to go to market, right? This is about innovation. Who doesn't want an organization that's innovative? Okay. Now look, all we're gonna do is show you how these concepts link to those four things that every organization wants. Collaborative, collaborative culture, organizational identification, discretionary effort, and team creativity. That's what we did. He's a CEO with a big organization. I'm a business dean with a big organization, 7,000 people, right, when I stepped down in 21. Responsible for 7,000, that's what I said, 7,000 people, trust me, there was something going on at all times. Am I right, Fern? Yep. That was a 24-7 job. There's stuff going on with that big of an organization all the time. And I loved getting these four things into the organization. Now, back up. We looked at the power of sense of belonging, which is where I started, and how sense of belonging affects those four outcomes. And if you look at sense of belonging and then you overlay DEI efforts, you can see how DEI affects sense of belonging and sense of belonging will focus on those four outcomes. This is the first step to ever do this. That's what we're doing, all right? Now when you look at that, what do you see? What comes to mind? What does that say? Anyone can go. And by the way, I'm a professor, so I can hang on for a long time. <laughs> 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 I'll give you lots of time to think. It's OK. It's all right with me. Anyone? What do you see? You see productivity. How? When you say productivity, you're talking about those four variables on the side, right? It's productivity. You're right about that. Okay. What's the effects that you're seeing? So remember, first of all, I mentioned one star, two star, three stars. Remember that? I call those P values. All right. Do you see any one stars up there? No. Do you see two stars? No. You see three stars. So we show we're showing you those significant relationships. All right, and when I say three stars, what does that mean? 99% sure that those relationships exist. Okay, and what you see there is your diversity. That's diversity of thought. That's like what we have in a room. We've got different demographic groups in the room. If we were to all put our ideas together, what we're gonna have is a collaborative culture. That's what that says. That's what that says. And we're 99% sure of that. We're 99% sure of that. Equity. If you look at equity, all right, you go see that arrow? It goes all the way over to a collaborative culture. Why? Because equity is based on fairness. When your people, your volunteers, your employees, when they know that you're fair, they collaborate more in your organization. Your volunteers will collaborate more. That's what that's saying. All right? Equity, equity is based on fairness. When you look at it, guess what equity does? It drives team creativity. Mm -hmm. All right, look at inclusion. What does inclusion do? Well, inclusion affects discretionary effort. That is true. That's why we have inclusive leadership. It will give you the discretionary effort. And that's just the beginning. Watch this. Remember, you're looking for paths. We didn't show any significant paths. Th those that are not significant, we didn't show that. That's what I meant. All right. But we're showing only the significant path, and we're showing three stars, which means we're 99% sure that this will happen. All right? Guess what? It gets even better. <laughs> it gets even better. Watch this. Not that one. This one. Remember, this is about unifying concepts. This is commonality, what we have in common, all right? It's about equality based on fairness. 
when I perceive that there's fairness. Both equity and equality are based in organizational justice theories. Fairness, that's what that means. When my people perceive that I'm fair, fair in terms of pay, fair in terms of performance, looking at whenever that happens, let's see what happens. Let's see. Commonality, when we know that we have things in common, commonality will lead to what? A collaborative culture. People will collaborate more and better. Commonality also drives a sense of belonging, which is the key concept in that. And look at what sense of belonging does. When you generate a sense of belonging with your team and your volunteers and the people in your community, when you do that sense of belonging, you're going to get all four of those things. Look at that. Collaborative culture, see sense of belonging, see the path, all significant. Sense of belonging will drive the org identification, it will also drive a discretionary effort going above and beyond what's expected, and will also drive innovation, team creativity. See that? Equality, fairness. When you get equality, it's going to drive a collaborative culture, that makes sense. When your organization believes that you're fair-minded, and that you have policies that can back that up, when you do that, you're going to drive a collaborative culture. Right? And by the way, these are direct and indirect effects. So you can still drive org identification through sense of belonging. See the path is significant from equality to sense of belonging, sense of belonging to org identification. That's how you're reading this stuff. That's how you're doing it. All right, when, you, when your people believe that you are about cohesion, that's working together. If you're a leader, you got people following you, and you can show that you value cohesion, and you do things to drive cohesion in your organization. Cohesion with your volunteers. Here's what you're gonna get. You're gonna get a direct effect on, you gotta follow that out all the way up. You're gonna have a collaborative culture. See that? All right, it's cohesion. It's gonna affect the discretionary effort. Cohesion is gonna drive team creativity. And then we said, wait a minute, we call it the kitchen sink. What happens when you put it all together? Mm -hmm. What happens when you put it all together? All right, you have VEI, you have CEC, which are unified concepts. What happens then? Here's the punchline, and then we'll stop the questions. Watch what happens when you put it all together. Now most audiences, not to challenge you, but most audiences, when I show them that, they go, wow. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I do, I'm, it's the stats, I know, I get it, I get it. I do fun presentations too. My wife is a test for it. This is meaningful, but I also do fun ones. But I get a wow when I talk about this. This shows you, this is the science behind it. When you combine it, you get the very best results. You get the very best results. We're not just showing you the stats. We're actually living this, all right? If you go inside in spirit and you read it in the book, if you go inside and you really watch what they're doing, wait a minute, okay, how many of you follow the stock, the stock market? Let me see a show of hands. All right, I didn't test this before I came up here. But let's, can you look at what the market is doing today? Someone, get your phone out and do the, see what the market is doing. Let's look at what the market is doing today. Up, down, what do you think? Uh, it's up, uh, it's up. All right, now I want you to look at NSP. Google that one, NSP, and look at this. I haven't looked at it today, so I'm, I'm really stepping out of my face. All right, look up NSP, that's for insperity. That's the company that we're talking yeah. about. Yeah. What's the stock today? Is it up or down? It's up. It's, uh, say again? It's up. How about that? That's the same company we're talking about. I'm showing you the results. Mm -hmm. This is what we're doing inside the company. And look at the results. Did everyone get that? Is, sir, what's your name again? Matt. Matt? Yeah. Matt, would you say very loudly, how much is the company up today? Uh, 
0.63%. That's just one measure of effectiveness, the stock market. You ought to see the collaboration that's going on in that organization. It is simply incredible. Why? For two years now, no, actually three, for three years now, we've been working with this organization, showing them this stuff. And this organization, by the way, is not just showing them, they're building it into the culture of the organization. All right? This is a culture-based perspective. So if you don't believe it, just look at the results. And you ought to see the collaboration that goes on in this organization. It's mind-boggling. I just spoke to, listen to this, I, I'm not kidding. Was it last week? I think it was last week, I lose track of time. Last week I was asked to go in and talk to the organization about the science. They wanted to know, they wanted to know more. And they were asking me really good questions about what is a correlation, what does that make that? And how do you measure that, those kinds of things, all right? Okay, look, there were 500 people on Zoom and another 100 to 200 people in the room. And I started off with, I didn't know we had that many people interested in statistics. <laughs> but they dug in. And the organization gets better and better. So now, we're out talking to other organizations. That's what we're doing. And we're saying, look, if we can go in and do a similar study in your organization, and let's look at the results. We can actually, look, we can change the minds and hearts of people. That's what this book is about. It's about changing the minds and hearts of people. And for those people who are skeptical, I'm showing you the science. This is not my opinion. This is the science of it, all right? And we're hoping that not only will it affect our companies, it will affect our communities. That's what this is about. And what's central to it, sense of belonging. That's where we started. What's central to it is this idea of unifying, not dividing. We have a whole list in the book of what we think about in terms of what's common. And I'm just going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to share with you. If you get it, you'll see it yourself. We have it in multiple places in this book, and I'm just going to close by mentioning this one piece. All right? Give me one second. I'll find the right page. We wrote the book, I should know. <laughs> it is necessary for our society and worthy of our concerted effort to chart a new way forward with a focus on three things. Commonality, the things we have in common, equality, opportunity, and reward for all people and cohesion, the things that bring us together. I ask that a desire to find commonality guide our efforts going forward, driven by these 10 principles. Common worth. We must start with an emphasis on the inherent worth of every person. This truth is the foundation for love and respect for every human, regardless of our differences common values. We must establish shared values to support the vision, shape, the culture, and provide the basis for how we interact with one another. <coughs> common ground. We must create opportunities for open, honest, and safe communication, including candid discussions about the causes of racism and bigotry, and determine the best approaches to eliminate these discussions may not always be comfortable, but through them, we can find the common ground that connects our unique experiences. Common aspirations. We must recognize every person's right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Every person deserves to feel safe and should have the opportunity to make life better for themselves and their loved ones. Common experiments. We must have a robust dialogue to learn about one another's point of view, sharing our experiences until we gain understanding and appreciation for one another. 
common goals. We must determine short, intermediate, and long-term objectives that can measure our progress in creating real opportunity for all. Only when we are working together toward clear, measurable goals will we affect change. Common sense. We must recognize human behavioral realities and tendencies and establish policies and practices that facilitate willing compliance. Common decency. It should go without saying that treating each other with respect is central to advancing any conversation about race and justice. Common good. We must create a sense of community that encourages individuals to set aside personal benefit for the benefit of others. Advancing the success of one of us advances the success of all of us. Common understanding. We must strive for a level of empathy that will inspire true care and concern for each other and embrace the role we each play in unlocking the potential of every person. That sounds good, doesn't it? Great. Great. And we have the science to show it. That's what we should be doing. And we're showing you the science behind it. That's what this is about, making differences work together. Wow. Um, if I know my staff, they probably pre-ordered my book already, uh, <laughs> November 1st, but um, thank you, Dr. Jones. Very insightful, I think. Um, it shouldn't be that hard to be good people. That's right. And you put the science to that. So thank you very much for everything that you do for me for this university and thank you for being here tonight. So one more round of applause.